Let's get started. Um, we, we're so glad that you are all here today to join us as we kick off another season of uh, webinars at the foundation um, with this one, Cultivating Theological Leadership. I know September is a busy time for most people, but probably particularly so for the types of people that would be interested in a theological education webinar. Um, so thank you very much for taking time out of your day to join us. Um, my name is Jessica Smith. I'm the Communications and Campaign Associate at the Foundation. Um, like I said, we've got a lot to pack into um, an hour today, and uh, we may or may not have our uh, moderator, Harry Osorin, to help us out. So let's uh, get started <laughs> and get as much done as we can. So I'm coming to you today from Mississauga, Ontario, which is just outside Toronto, close to the General Council office on the traditional lands of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. These people remain here as the original and rightful stewards of the land. And there are messages in the landscape of history, of surviving and resurfacing place names, of teachings, and of stories passed down and those yet to be told. In our work, uh, and in our lives, we commit to honoring the ancient and still unfolding story of this land, story of these people and the story of their sovereignty. I invite you to take a moment to think about the land that you're on as well. Um, and we're going to get into it. Um, is, is Harry here? Did he come back in? Um, so the United Church of Canada has a historic commitment to learning both in schools for basic education for all Canadian residents, as well as church leaders for preaching, teaching and caring. We are joined today by the Reverend Dr. Harry Soren, possibly, um, um, who is on our Scholarships and Academics Awards Subcommittee and has long been a vocal champion of supporting theological education. He's had many conversations over the years about how the foundation can provide even more support to United Church scholars. Um, we're grateful for his leadership there and his perseverance and dedication to the matter, which um, uh, is part of the reason that we can bring you this webinar today. Harry has four graduate degrees, uh, earned at universities in Hamburg, Toronto, and Geneva, and is now retired after more than 50 years of ministry. Um, he's here to moderate the discussion, um, hopefully, between our three panelists whose academic journeys have intertwined with the foundation um, in different ways. Uh, we have the Reverend Dr. Michelle Voss, who is a past principal of Emanuel College. She was the first woman in the school's history to hold that position. Um, and a, as a professor of theology now, Michelle is helping to train a generation of leaders who approach religious diversity, gender, race, and disability with curiosity and respect. She's authored several books and academic articles which bring theology to life as an interreligious conversation that can flourish in today's diverse communities. Also joining us is the Reverend Dr. Jennifer Jansen Ball, who is currently the Executive Minister of Theological Leadership at the General Counsel Office. Jennifer earned her PhD in Christian Social Ethics through Emanuel College and the University of St. Michael's College, Toronto School of Theology. Throughout her studies, she worked part-time with various organizations, including the Student Christian Movement in Canada, United Church Congregations in the General Counsel Office, as well as teaching at Emanuel and the Queen's School of Religion. She is passionate about eco-theological ethics and the climate crisis. Um, and Last but not least, we have the Reverend Samuel P. Grottenberg. He is a self-described Bible nerd whose heart for ministry is centered around the interpretation of biblical texts for life in today's world and shepherding people in discipleship to Jesus. Sam has a Master of Arts in Theological Studies from Regent College, Diploma in Denominational Studies, United Church from VST, and a Bachelor of Arts in Leadership Development from Rocky Mountain Bible College. And he's currently working towards his PhD in Divinity New Testament through the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. Um, and we got to hear a sneak peek of that work that he's doing at our AGM this past spring, which was very exciting for everybody who was there. Um, is Harry here? I would like to pass it to him if he's here. Okay. So I will get started with the questions. Um, I think Harry was gonna do a, a little intro. Um, maybe I can say that. 
Uh, over the past 100 years, 100 years, the United Church has played a significant role in religious fabric of Canada, calling for greater justice in relations to economic inequities, women's rights to us LGBTQIA plus communities, reconciliation and racial discrimination, um, etc. It's moved from a mission of converting non-Christians to, as Christians, fostering relationships of respect and learning about difference and shared visions and seeking justice for all God's yearning in a broken world. The UCC has a history and a particular identity worth researching and sharing. Both its regrettable sins and its courageous witness over almost 100 years is indispensable data for faithful individuals and communities for the next 100 the Canadian nation and a faithful church, whatever size it may become, need competent researchers and imaginative teachers who have lived in and understand both contexts, the United Church and Canada, as people of faith seek to address the immense global and local issues of our time in the years ahead. Among um, our various service offerings, the United Church of Canada Foundation facilitates various academic award opportunities for United Church of Canada ministers, ministry students, lay people, and we proudly support scholars with financial assistance each year. Harry, are you here? Last call. Okay. Um, I will just start into the questions. Um, so it's become increasingly clear that we live in a time of incredible and comprehensible um, new knowledge, but it's also uh, a great threat to human life through war, disease, environmental failures, and overconsumption of the Earth's limited resources. Um, does the church have a special responsibility to contribute its particular knowledge and wisdom to this situation? And what is the role of the academic? Uh, as Jennifer here, I can I can start and Thanks. try not to take too much time because I'd love to hear from Michelle and Sam as well. Um, but I do think the church has a special responsibility to contribute knowledge and wisdom in the face of all those kinds of crises facing humankind. Um, I've heard many times in it related to various issues that the church does need to be present and speak and contribute um, our spiritual and religious wisdom and traditions, as well as scientific knowledge and uh, insight that we need a kind of more holistic approach to the problems that are facing us. And I think we have a particular responsibility around the climate crisis because a kind of Western European um, theology has helped to contribute to the sense of the earth um, basically being humankind's to do with what we please. And uh, the, the, there's more nuance to that, but I think we have a particular responsibility then to continue to challenge that kind of theology and to um, kind of deepen our and strengthen our theological muscles in responding to the climate crisis in particular. That um, Jennifer's really nicely framed that that the church as a whole needs to have a voice and um, and, and to bring theological perspectives to bear, but also very informed theological perspectives, right? So to, to a, attend to the climate crisis, um, it's very interdisciplinary. There's science and and there's also the pastoral dimension of um uh, relating to people's climate grief and and supporting activism and so forth. Uh, so so coming to you here from uh, one of the theological schools, I, I think about our uh, our capacity also at, at, in a teaching function. And uh, the I've had the privilege of working with um, with Harry and and others on on a working group looking at uh, theological education in the United Church and. Um, the, the the scriptural passage that comes to mind um, all the time for me is from 1 Corinthians, where um, Paul is talking about the variety of gifts within the body of Christ, and it names teachers among those whom God has appointed to manifest the spirit in a particular way for the common good. Um, it says, you know, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, um, do all, you know, possess gifts of healing and so forth. Um, and in the point about the body of Christ is all of those things are necessary. And so some of us um, are invited to use our gifts to do the research-based scholarship so that that all of the important perspectives on issues like climate change and all of the other urgent issues in um, uh, facing us have um 
have knowledge, have, have important knowledge to, to back that up. And then also to train ministers who are leading communities to address those needs. Um, and, you know, I, I really think that the importance of having uh, solid um, teaching capacities uh, can't be underestimated. I, I think we've all probably seen examples of the kind of harm that can be done to individuals and communities by bad theology, by poor use of scripture, lack of historical understanding, lack of critical thinking, and inappropriate approaches to pastoral care, right? So research and teaching is part of how we honor God by supporting ministry and forming ministers and providing uh, the church with good resources. Yeah, I think I, I um, appreciate the framing of, of both Jennifer and Michelle's answers in terms of engaging the world in the midst of the, um, you know, social, political, uh, climate issues that that we're facing. And for me, I think the the unique, uh, perhaps perspective that the church can bring, the role that we have, um, is rooted in our call to proclaim the good news of Jesus, both in word and in action. And what I mean to say is that in every generation throughout the church's history and across different cultural contexts, we've we've often faced these existential questions, whether they be persecution or minority status or exile or schism, whatever it might be. And when we've been at our worst, we've tried to solve those through our own ingenuity and political power, et cetera. But when we've been at our best, we've renewed and revived our commitment to um, uh, the, the message of Christ crucified and risen. And so uh, for me, the, the, the academic's role is to draw out and remember and re reteach that story of scripture that, that um, our faith is rooted in to, to remind the church to remember the story and to live the story. Um, we, we're not going to do a better job than the, than the world at large at, at self-help or generic wisdom or sort of hodgepodge solutions, but we do have this faith once delivered um, to the saints to steward and to hold out and to um, to kind of have here with open hands as we engage with our with our neighbors, with our siblings to um, to tackle those um, those really big problems that we're facing. Um, so to pull it back into these um, recurring themes of stewardship of creation and robust community structures that live in the Hebrew scriptures, and then to um, remind ourselves to live into resurrection uh, as the, the New Testament church did. So, yeah. So is the United Church of Canada equipped to do that with leaders who understand the Canadian context um, and the particular gifts, um, failures, successes of the United Church as a faith-based community? Um, is the pool of scholars adequate? Um, is theological scholarship an essential part of the life of the church? I'd, I'd love to uh, to start off with that one. Um, I, I had the principal, uh, I had the privilege of working at Emmanuel College as principal when some of the brightest lights of a generation of United Church scholars were starting to retire. So Phyllis Earhart, a historian, Michael Bourgeois, a theologian, Marilyn Legg, an ethicist, Bill Curvin, liturgical theologian, and um, Paul Scott Wilson, who really shaped the preaching of so many United Church ministers, uh, just to name a few. Um, and uh, and it would be really hard right now, I think, to amass a group like that again. Um, as they retired, I chaired seven faculty searches to renew our faculty complement. And I'm really proud and we are really glad that we were able to hire a diverse group of Canadian scholars. And so, um, you know, the Canadian context piece is, is really important for theological education. And, um, and some, of, some of the folks that we were able to hire, like myself, have pursued um, admission into the order of ministry in the United Church of Canada and are very dedicated to teaching in this context. Um, at the same time, as you know, we're, we're finding fresh uh, scholar, uh, scholars and, and perspectives and people to do this work, um, you know, and without betraying the confidentiality of the searches that I chaired, it's safe to say that we did not have a deep pool of United Church of Canada applicants. In fact, I I thought it seemed to me that there was a missing generation. 
Uh, and you may, uh, Harry may have some of the data to uh, confirm uh, why that would be. Our working group heard from a lot of clergy that they had been discouraged from pursuing further study as a part of their ministry. And um, fortunately, that's changing. And there's a, um, at, just from anecdotally what I know at Emmanuel, we have a small but brilliant cohort of United Church scholars who are, who are working on their PhDs right now. Um, but they won't be enough to fill, say, the faculties of all of our theological schools just yet. Uh, but they're definitely going to make an impact. And, and so then we're going to need to support them so that we can uh, meet that goal. Um, Michelle, it's fascinating to hear that that story of the seven faculty searches during your tenure as as president because it it sort of highlights the i think the gap right and uh, i my my perspective in terms of in my sub discipline in in new testament studies and and searching for a supervisor when i was beginning doctoral work um i i didn't find uh great um vast resources of of that availability in canada which one of the reasons i'm studying in, in the UK. And so I think um, having this conversation about cultivating leaders in the Canadian context, in the United Church context, is is maybe one that we should have been having 10 years ago, but but um, is, is timely. And um, when I, I look at some of my uh, colleagues in, in, the, in the throes of PhD studies, I'm, I'm excited for the future. Um, of what what United you know, Church scholarship can look like, um, I think I think it is an essential part of the life of church. I mean, it, it has been since the beginning, um, from synagogue schools and rabbinic Judaism, where the which is the waters in which the church kind of swam for the first few decades, to teaching and catechesis and uh, creedal development being central to our witness. Um, I tend to think that in in our current um, generation, uh, creative and critical and constructive methods have had a tendency to draw the academy at large, I'm not saying just in Canada, um, kind of away from the everyday lives of Canadians and Christians. And I, I don't see that problem as much expressed in the early church. They're, they're concerned with people living life in Christ together in community and the, the teaching and, and um, sort of discourse we get um, is oriented towards discipling um, people in the way of Jesus. So I think the essential part is, is theological scholarship within and for the life of the church. So both robust contributive work and, and equipping, and particularly I think uh, hermeneutical equipping um, uh, for, for clergy, for lay people, um, is going to play a huge role as we move further and further away from a place where theology and biblical knowledge is sort of commonplace in the culture. Um, we can't do biblical scholarship in the way of American mainline Christians, nor can we do it in the way of global Catholics or Anglicans, nor in the way that secular religious studies departments do. And so how do we kind of come to um, a place where we have um, tools to, to pull out of our belt that are kind of in the family, so to speak? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll just say the the authority and interpretation of scripture document from the early 90s is a United Church document, and it will change your life. Um, so everybody should uh, take that up. But that's an example of something that we did together as a community while engaging uh, our wider Christian family. So, yeah. I think uh, Sam and Michelle have named some of the things that I was going to say in response. Um, but I do want to pick up, I think, on on something that Sam was saying, and maybe not quite what you, what you were saying, but a bit of a different take on it that um, like, absolutely, I agree that theological scholarship is is necessary for the life of the church, for the life of the United Church of Canada in particular. Um, and to affirm that like scholarship takes different forms these days. And like we draw on lived experience on diverse identities. Um, the traditions of our faith, but also as Michelle had referenced earlier, like interdisciplinary um, knowledge. And so the ways in which that scholarship can be lived out um, in the life of the church as a whole is, is absolutely at our schools as like the key place for education and formation for ministry for lay people and people um, seeking to be part of one of our streams of ministry. And 
our uh, faculty are also like engaged scholars. So they're present in the life of local churches, in the lives of our regional councils, offering scholarship and engagement um, at, in those ways as well. So not solely located in the place of our schools, but also kind of imbued throughout the church. And I think we haven't done um, well sometimes as a whole is rec at recognizing that and honoring the kind of gifts that are offered. Um, I think sometimes there's a bit of suspicion of academic and not understanding that in fact, like our theology is our faith seeking understanding and our scholars help us to do that wherever they're located throughout the church. So I would say um, we do also need to kind of keep reminding the church that the schools aren't off over here and our scholars and faculty aren't off over here. They're throughout the church and offering gifts um, freely and with deep love and passion for the church. Um, Harry has sent me a message that um, hopefully will just provide some color to the conversation. Um, he said, for me, the ability of the church to reflect deeply and truthfully on both its heritage and understanding of the creator is crucial as we continue in a world where knowledge is exploding and the threat to existence and the planet are so substantial. We need gifted, dedicated United Church of Canada Canadian scholars to ensure that the United Church of Canada heritage is stewarded as we move into these turbulent times. Thanks, Harry. Um, so you guys all sort of touched on the, uh, I guess a, a missing generation. So what what are the obstacles as, aside from overtly saying do not continue this um, in your ministry, don't continue your studies in your ministry? What are the obstacles that are preventing um, these people of faith from pursuing degrees that would qualify them for for the leadership roles in the church? To name some of the barriers that I I have faced as as a doctoral student: um, uh, money, time language preparation, geography, um, Canadian biblical studies programs. Uh, there's there's sort of a, a, um, multifaceted reasons why uh, there are barriers. There, there are barriers um, for our, our our students, I think. Um, I think also the 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 delicate balance that that folks who work in theological school administration um, are are figuring out in in this sort of new age that we are in um, is professional preparation for ministry and uh, um, sort of uh, robust academic uh, formation can be difficult balls to juggle at, at the same time and um, when it's when it's done uh, faithfully and prayerfully I think it, it it can really be amazing for kind of creating the type of um, programs and cultivating the type of leaders that we've been talking about. Um, but, uh, but I, I recognize that that's not an easy sort of, um, thing to kind of balance in the 90 credits of your, of your MDiv program or whatever it might be. Um, and the other thing I think is sort of, I think Jennifer touched on this a little bit in, um, her comments around where, where, where theological scholarship lives in, in the church. Um, I, I have found in my pastoral life that there's a tendency for United Church people and clergy to kind of, um, there's that suspicion that, that Jennifer referenced. They sort of avoid the um, the, the theolo theology discussions, uh, especially when they are coming maybe from certain branches of the, the wider church. And I think we need to re-embrace our identity, both at you know a local congregational level, but at all levels of the church too, as our identity is uniting and and find forums for engagement in that that work beyond our our particular um sort of echo chambers that that can tend to develop so um yeah thanks sam i um i totally resonate with all the barriers that you named as well in terms of my own doctoral studies and i think Jessica, when you read my bio, it indicated I was working half time up to full time actually while I was pursuing doctoral studies. And so, um, which was to support myself financially. So finances are a barrier, but the, the reality of that then meant um, little time and energy to put into some of the other things that would 
contribute to um, being a scholar in the United Church around um, preparing articles for presentation at conferences and publication. Uh, I mean, I have some teaching experience, right? But but so I think that because finances are a barrier, it has this other impact too in terms of um, both pursuing a doctoral degree, but then with if you do end up doing that within that, how do you gain the kind of um, learning about how to be an academic, right? And then have that kind of depth around publication and teaching that um, is, is foundational for continuing in the profession. And I th the other thing I do wanna name are the um, other systemic barriers that I think a lot of people face around racism, um, sexism, classism as well. Um, so I think, and our, our schools and the United Church have made lots of commitments around addressing those barriers and are living that out in very concrete ways. And there's always more that we need to keep doing um, to address that. I appreciate those um, systemic barriers that you highlight because um, they affect everything and, um, and the preparation of, of uh, teachers, leaders, and scholars um, as well. And um, this question about obstacles is such an important one. I've uh, experienced them as a graduate student myself. Uh, when I was the academic dean uh, and, and dealt with folks um, trying to make progress through their through their degrees I uh, have so many anecdotal stories which are really for you know those folks to share so I'll pull out some themes um and uh and you know looking at things like completion rates uh, uh in, in programs it really points to the fact that they are there are barriers and um so I'll just reiterate a couple of things one is that it takes time it takes time to uh to pursue these degrees and uh, to to take on the the role of someone who who is qualified to teach, say in a theological school, um, you're looking at someone who needs to have a two or three year master's degree, so a master of divinity or a research master's, uh, in order to qualify to apply for a PhD. And a PhD can take between four and ten or more years to complete. It is a huge sacrifice to give up an income to study full time um, and, and full time study is really what is required to finish a degree like that in the shortest amount of time possible. Graduate students are adults. And many of them have households to support. They have children or elders to care for, possibly their own health and other kinds of challenges. And the financial and care needs can pull people away from full-time work on their dissertation. You know, I tell people when they're applying, this is a full-time job. Um, and a lot of times it's not, uh, you know, it, it takes a long time because people aren't able to do it as a full-time job. Um, and, and sometimes they're pulled away from their dissertation by low paying teaching work as adjuncts or other kinds of work. And, you know, a lot of people don't finish. Um, so, you know, when, when I was principal at Emmanuel, we did make several moves to increase our graduate awards and to make a, a manual an attractive place for Canadians to come and stay in Canada and do their doctoral work. Um, but frankly, the Canadian schools have had a hard time keeping up with the top U.S. schools. Um, the school, uh, they, they offer substantial living stipends in addition to full tuition, right? Which allows folks to treat their graduate education as a full-time job so that they can be prepared to then enter, you know, the, the teaching positions and, and to do that work in a timely way. Um, and I think it's wonderful when Canadian students get to have that kind of aid when they when they study at, at one of these schools that can offer it, but then not all of them might come back and teach here in Canada, right? And some some have, and um, I, I would just really love to see our schools and our denomination be able to offer the kind of support uh, to so that folks can treat this preparation as their job so that they can do this work in the church. Thank you to you all for that. The it's interesting because you're all coming at it from completely different perspectives, um, but you all kind of come to the same uh, conclusions. Um, Michelle was part of um, a task group, as was Harry Osorin, for um, uh, 
coming up with ways to enhance the the United Church's pool of theological leadership. Um, and they identified a bunch of issues. I'll just read out the list. The lack of appreciation for the role of research and teaching for the church's diverse ministries, the general decline of church membership, lack of inviting and mentoring gifted persons to further study in the theology and ministry, lack of academic employment opportunities for holders of doctorate doctorate degrees in Canada, church processes blocking employment while studying, the high cost of doing graduate studies, and students' high debt loads from undergraduate studies. That first one that I mentioned there, I think, is um, kind of what Rob is talking about in the, in the chat. A barrier we rarely name is the anti-intellectualism in the wider culture that also seeps into the church to offer intellectual leadership is sometimes dismissed, mocked, or treated with suspicion. You all mentioned that uh, money is a serious barrier. Graduate studies in any subject require passion for researching and learning, time to reflect and discern, um, and while also maintaining the basics of living. Um, you have to have enough money for the overall cost of your life, plus the tuition and any other costs related to study. Um, and you kind of have to know that you have that in advance of even pursuing this in the first place. Uh, research shows that students pursuing graduate theological studies struggle significantly with debts and inadequate sources of income to pursue their academic goal. How do you think that we best address this issue? Uh, what more can be done to invite and encourage gifted people to pursue graduate theological degrees? So I'll just reiterate one uh, thing that, that has come up uh, in passing, uh, so what can we do to encourage? Uh, one thing is in in congregations and in candidacy boards, um, it's important to recognize and normalize theological scholarship as a path of ministry. And um, often it's, uh, especially amid the the kind of anti-intellectual climate that, that Rob mentions, or the, the kind of thought like we don't um, uh, you, you know, it takes all kinds of forms like, you know, scholars are disconnected from real life or, um, you know, devaluing what, what they bring, like any, any, any lay person can, can do exactly what they've done, um, that kind of thing, um, to, to normalize and to value and to recognize it as a calling and a, and a spiritual gift, uh, to the church and to the world. And in order to do that, that's going to take some education about, uh, about what theological scholarship is, what it, what it takes to do it well. And then also how things like the candidacy process intersects with academic preparation. I just will pick up a little on that. Um, if we have time, maybe we don't. <laughs> um, just to say too, I think that uh, like representation matters <laughs> and it matters for the sake of the church and it matters in terms of the wholeness of the church and the vision that the, the church should be reflecting the diversity of God's creation. Um, and it, it matters for people being able to say, oh, yeah, actually that might be something that I can pursue and then have the encouragement and support of communities as well as like individuals within their lives, but also the wider support of the church that, church that Michelle referenced. So um, there's a meme that goes around regularly about the Scully effect. So um, people, women in particular who watched the X-Files and saw Scully as a female scientist, uh, it increased enrollment in science degrees in particular. So I think the same thing applies for th for people in the church thinking that um, theological scholarship is indeed uh, a ministry, a calling and a profession that they they can embrace as well. Just makes me think of various um, conversations I've had with candidates I, I'm on my can the candidacy board in my my region and um, the the number of times we circle around to some theological avenue that a, that a particular candidate is just fascinated by uh, that that's one opportunity in the process to um to coax people towards <laughs> further study and to have those conversations but to kind of bake that into our um our candidacy pathway process i think is, is a really good idea um yeah and i would just echo michelle's comments earlier about um finding more ways at the school levels to have living stipends and, and fully funded education schemes um uh, it's it's uh, becoming rarer and rarer whereas i think we need it to become more and more common <laughs> i would love your opinion on what you 
think an organization like the foundation could do more of to um, support? Uh, well, I mean, I think what Michelle and, and Sam just referenced in terms of living stipends, like that requires significant funds invested so that interest can be used to provide those kinds of stipends. And I mean, our schools that do offer doctoral programs do have scholarships, but it's not to the same level that Michelle was referencing. So absolutely, the foundation would have a role in, in kind of helping to, um, as this webinar is trying to do, make visible and value the work of theological scholarship within the life of the church um, and to, you know, seek more funders for that kind of opportunity. I know I've received some scholarships from the foundation um, that were helpful, but, you know, they were smaller. They weren't a kind of living stipend that Michelle referenced. So, um, and I know that Harry in particular has been very passionate about trying to reach out to folks who uh, also value, value this and might have some, um, opportunity to help support financially. I want to lift up that the foundation does um, does offer scholarships and each one of them, even if it's relatively small, and I know that the um, Harry has shared that the scholarship committee received many times the um, the need is much greater than what the foundation can support in terms of the applications that it vets. But even if even those small um, pieces provide relief, right? So that the mental and spiritual and physical energies of candidates, um, that they can spend that on, on their work and not on worrying about money. Uh, and yes, it often the, the way that it is now is that folks have to cobble together maybe a number of smaller sources to make this work. Um, and I, I think the foundation should absolutely keep doing that, but then also probably look to, um, you know, recognize that when people are cobbling together small funds like that, that 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 in turn also is still requiring quite a bit of energy and and the uncertainty of having, um, you know one-offs, right? And so, okay, this year I got this scholarship, but now I have to start already thinking about next year, knowing that this is going to be a, a program that lasts a certain number of years, multi-year scholarships could also really help people plan for their course of study. I should say yes and amen. Um, <laughs> I I, I am currently funded by um, by foundation scholarships, and I'm so thankful for that generosity. And uh, quite plainly, wouldn't be able to be pursuing a PhD were it not for for that support. Um, but I think too that the other piece of that is the financial support also represents the community of faith's investment through prayer and relationship and and faithfulness, right? And you know those seasons of dissertation writing where you just fall into a slump I've often in my prayer time fallen back on but oh no the church wants me to be doing this and they're they're with me in this and that that um that's as important as as the dollars um and I, I think cultivating that kind of community of of emerging scholarship is is a key role the foundation can play and you all for that. I think we're gonna we're gonna wind it down and see if anybody wants to put any comments or questions for our panel um, in the chat. And while you do that, maybe the panel can also reflect on if you have any other things that you'd like to add about um, um, how the foundation has played a role in your own journey, or how you've witnessed the foundation playing a role in the journey of students um, that you've worked with. Um, anything that you'd like to speak on. Um, other outside of that topic would also be welcome. And again, if anybody has any comments or questions, please put them in the chat and we can get to those. Maybe one of the things that I'll add is just to say, um, direct tap on people's shoulders to encourage them to think about further studies is also really important. Like thinking about my own journey. Um, a couple of my profs when I was doing my MDiv encouraged me to think about further study. And I, probably wouldn't have had the confidence myself at that point in time to think that I that was something that I could do but because others had seen that in me and could see that being called forth um I didn't immediately go into doctoral studies I I was ordained and served three years in pastoral ministry but but I don't know that I would have pursued doctoral studies at all if they hadn't had those conversations with me so I think we can't underestimate the power of 
of that either. Um, so just wanted to name that for everybody who's on the call too and think about your own role in potentially calling forth those gifts of others that you see or, or you know, helping discover them in yourself. I would would conclude with a note of um, optimism and hope. Uh, I'm so glad that we're having this conversation, and um, and and I I received so much hope also from our United Church graduate students who are doing really important leading edge work and are going to be um, so instrumental to shaping the next generation of ministers and scholars. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm delighted that, you know, our our moderator, the right Reverend Carmen Lansdowne, um, she is one of the folks who um, was able to uh, pursue her, her doctoral studies as, as a ministry. And um, after her time as a moderator, she'll be joining us at Emmanuel on our faculty in a, in a new United Church Studies position. And so this, this really does bode well for not only ensuring that our ministers have, uh, um, have solid grounding, but also that it's creating space for additional research in um, in United Church theology and history and in the other disciplines, so I I do have a great deal of optimism, and I'm really so glad that Harry is leading these uh, you know leading us to have these conversations, and that the United Church Foundation is um, is drawing attention to it as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the conversation. I'm really thrilled that it's something that is a live dialogue in the church right now as we kind of consider the the next um decades that are ahead um when i saw the title for today's webinar uh, about cultivating uh jesus parable parables um and other teachings around sowing and agricultural imagery really kind of fell into my my mind and and also the fact that the New Testament authors pick up that cultivation imagery um, in a communal context. And so um, I just, uh, my kind of final thought is to encourage us as a community of faith across the country and around the world um, to continue that sowing and cultivating and reaping work um, and consider it God's work that we are participating in through prayer and through relationship and through faith um, as we take the next steps. So. Thank you. Thank you all for ending on an encouraging and hopeful note. We, we're, we're very grateful to Harry for keeping this conversation um, afloat, um, despite other people maybe not listening at, at times. Um, Harry is very uh, uh, focused on this. So we're, we're grateful to him for that and, and to uh, him for persevering over the years with that conversation. Um, and thank you, Harry, for being here, even though your audio and microphone are not working today. Um, you're here with us and you're moderating in spirit. So thank you to that. And thank you to all of our panelists, uh, Sam, Michelle, Jennifer. Uh, thank you for all sharing your stories. Uh, we appreciate all of you, the different perspectives and the, the wisdom and clear passion that you all have for this subject um, and for taking the time um, out of your day. And thank Thank you everyone for attending. Um, I hope that you will um, share what you've learned today and share the recording when we give it to you um, and share the conversation, have the conversation with others who are also interested in this topic. Um, we, we could probably uh, have several of these um, with, with other perspectives as well. So if more and more people you know, are coming to the, the foundation and saying that this is an important topic, we can facilitate more of these webinars um, uh, as interest dictates. Um, the, the scholarship opportunities that are available um, at the foundation, the testimonies that are shared by our panel, the thoughts and importance um, of supporting theological education in the United Church and in the Canadian context um, are all conversations that are worthy of, of having. So we can come at it from all those different angles as well. Uh, secondly, I ask that you would make a gift today to the foundation that will help us strengthen our capacity to support um, uh, talented scholars. We're presenting this panel as part of our um, initiative that we're having right now, supporting theological leadership. Um, academic study is important to uh, the present and the future of our United Church, uh, Canadian society, 
needs the voices of people of faith to share clear thinking um, for the healing of creation. But because you made the decision to attend this today, I imagine that you also believe this. Um, as all of our panelists touched on, scholarship at opportunities at the foundation um, may uh, offer only a little bit of, of the, the big financial picture for people who are pursuing this as their ministry. Um, but scholarship opportunities are at the foundation are a smart and sustainable way to support theological leadership. Um, we're able to offer the grants thanks to people who believe that academic study and education is important to our church, but the funds available tend to reflect the generosity of past years and maybe not the realistic costs in 2023. Um, this past spring, our scholarship and bursary requests totaled over uh, $300,000, but we were only able to grant less than half of that amount. Um, that means students will go deeper into debt, uh, part-time studies, they may choose other paths of service. Um, so if you can make a gift today, uh, that will enable us to provide more and more importantly, more meaningful uh, support to those who need it. Um, there, Ashley's just put a link in the chat if you um, are interested in learning more about it or, or to make a gift. Um, and we would be deeply grateful to have the conversation with you or um, to accept your gift. So thank you all again for attending today. Um, thank you again to our panelists and to Harry. Hopefully next time you will be able to, we'll be able to hear your voice and you'll be able to moderate the discussion for us. Um, blessings on the rest of your day. Bye everybody. <laughs>